This is the Rich Dad Stockcast with Andy Tanner, the show that kicks 401ks in the asphalt and teaches you to be the master of your own stock investing domain. And here's your host, Greg Arthur. Welcome to the show, everybody. This one is capital gains versus cash flow, or at least the difference between the two. But we're going to add a third element that's uh, talked about a little bit less, maybe way less. Uh, before we get too crazy, let's make sure we leave comments, so especially on future shows, maybe how great Andy is. That's always a good one. Oh, no. No, 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 no. Uh, and also, please, please click like. And if you if you have a mailbox, send a letter to somebody and tell them about the show. So let's get started, Andy Tanner. We are talking right. cash flow versus capital gains, but specifically in the stock market. Yeah. 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 Um, I think cash flow versus capital gains is one of the most important um, lessons that a new investor can learn. Uh, you know, generally, uh, when you talk about the stock market in general, you're talking about the prices of stocks and stock prices. Um, sometimes when you talk housing, you talk about housing prices and what is the price of the asset itself. And generally, you know, CNBC and, and you know, different platforms, almost every newsletter that's around uh, is a buy low, sell high dream. You know, what, what's going up? Uh, what's the next big stock that's going to go? Or big newsmakers, well, gee, you know, Apple stock was here and now it's split. And boy, if you'd have bought it back then and yeah, they're, idea, they're hype machines. Yeah, this idea of buy low, sell high. And, and part of this is difficult because once a, a company goes public, uh, it falls into that realm. And, and once a real estate project goes up for sale, it, it, it falls into that realm. And it can become detached from what we call fundamentals, uh, detached from you know, how well does this business do? So if you were to look at Warren Buffett, who is my favorite person to study, I think he's a good one uh, to study. Uh, Berkshire Hathaway, his holding company has uh, basically two categories of companies. They have companies that they own the whole thing, like Duracell, Fruit of the Loom, Seize Candies, uh, Geico Insurance. They, they, these, they own the whole thing. Um, so when you buy you know, Dairy Queen, you know, so when you go to Dairy Queen and buy a Blizzard, all that's Warren Buffett. And that company's not for sale on an exchange. You can't buy pieces of it. You can't buy shares uh, or take stock in that company. So if there were a bad day in the market uh, and you say, hey, Warren, uh, you know, Charlie, uh, his partner, Charlie Munger, hey, Dow's down a thousand points today. Uh, how would they feel about Fruit of the Loom? Well, they really don't care and that's a real key thing is that for that entire half of their business, they have no concern at all in tough times or really in prosperous times about a price of a company. They're saying, look, is Fruit of Loom selling t-shirts and underwear? Uh, is Dairy Queen selling blizzards? Is Seize Candy? They, they only make money in December. That's the only month of the year they make money in. Uh, the people buying batteries at Dorso, they're buying Geico insurance. Is a lizard commercial working? And to be able to detach yourself uh, from an obsession with stock prices is an amazing thing. Uh, and, and the same thing is true with real estate. A house flipper is going to say, I want to buy this house, flip it, you know, buy it low, sell it high. But a house, uh, a, a landlord or someone who hires a, a manager to take that role is concerned with rent and what it produces. Uh, I, I loved what, what Charlie and, and Bob had to say about you know, Bitcoin. They said it's like a farm. You know, if you had a farm and you don't have any crop coming out of it, it's just land, your only hope is that someone will someday pay more for it than you did. That's very much true with gold, very much true with Bitcoin, very much true with, with assets that are simply priced. But if you, if you actually have operations on the land, it can produce cash flow. So when a person looks at investing, uh, one of the very clear things they want to get clear on is, am I investing for capital gains as my goal? Or do I want to build a consistent cash flow through some type of value that's produced out of that asset on a regular basis? In the case of real estate, that would be rent, vending machines, uh, parking fees, uh, you know, things that can produce income aside from the price of the home. 
Okay, what well, is it in stocks though? Dividends. Dividends, okay. Yeah, and and in the idea of dividends is is almost identical. If you if you were to understand a real estate distribution, for example, I don't invest near. I mean, not even close. I mean, I think Kenny has you know close between eight and ten thousand units. Okay, I do not have eight to ten thousand units. Hey, right. Kenny, close. Kenny's the rich dad real estate advisor. Correct, and and, and Robert and Kim invest heavily with him. Yep. Yep. Okay. But I do participate in some of those syndications. So what happens is, is someone like Kenny will say, Hey, I'm going to get a loan from the bank. Uh, 75% of this money is going to come from the bank. I need 25% from you to buy this and then we'll all own it. And once I buy this, you know, depending on how much money you want to put in, we'll, I'll pay you your share, your fair share of the profits, depending on how much money you put in. So I might have a large share or a small share, but all of these investors, when the revenue comes in, if there's any you know, operating income, you know, they call it NOI, if there's any extra income after everything is paid, uh, there'll be a distribution of some kind. And you can think about people around a, a table where you're playing cards, you know, maybe you're playing hearts or whatever with your friends and everyone deals out the cards. So what do you do? You're distributing the cards to everyone. Well, you could also say I'm dividing them among people. So it's really semantics. Uh, stock shareholders receive often a dividend from profits. And so to, to grasp that you're a literal owner of McDonald's, let's say, or you know, AT&T or, or whatever, you know, someone uses their phone and makes a phone call that's the service at and provides. They write a very real check with real money. Uh, the, the, if you don't believe that, that that's a real business, stop paying your phone bill and see if your phone keeps working, right? It's a real business. And, uh, and, and so those profits get distributed uh, to, to investors and that's cash flow. Now, what's interesting is what if, Greg, I said, what if you received a letter that said, here is your great you know, Uncle Andy who passed away and he's left you 10,000 shares of you know, Apple. Here's the deal. Your acceptance of this is contingent that it is in a trust and you get to be a steward of, or beneficiary of this trust where you can collect all the dividends that come throughout your lifetime. But upon your death, the new beneficiary will be your posterity. In other words, you're not allowed to sell it, which means the price would now be irrelevant to you. Correct. Would you be okay with that? Yes, I'd be would thrilled. You say, or would you say, no, no, I need to be able to sell it or I don't want it. I need to, I need to know what the price stock is so I can sell it. Or would you say, freak, man, awesome, cash flow, beautiful. Yeah. That's very much, I, I've never interviewed Warren Buffett, but I think that's very much how he feels as I've read his letters that, he says every, you know, in his last year's letter, operational cash flow is the most important part of a business. Are they serving a community? Are, are people giving them their dollars for something of value? And, and operational cash flow is a big deal. Well, if you introduce additional incomes, you might take the attitude that I really like of saying, okay, if, if I want to divorce myself from stock price, and, and detach myself might be a better word for it. Let's say I look at a company like um, Verizon and I see Verizon is maybe $40, $50, whatever it is. I don't worry, I, how do I say I'm gonna buy this without worrying that the price will go up or down? I just say, ideally, if you, if you start a business, ideally it would last for generations and you'd have a dynasty. Maybe someone says, hey, I'll build it big and sell it, but whoever you sold it to probably makes more money after you do. So the maximal, if it's worth selling, it's probably worth keeping, right? If it's worth, if, if someone is willing to buy it, it's probably worth keeping for you. Right. right. So, so what if I said this, okay, Verizon pays a 5% dividend. So every year um, I get 5%. So in 20 years it pay for itself. So if I'm my son's age and I say, all right, 16 plus 20 years is 36. What if you could buy your Verizon by the time you were 36 years old, it was paid for. In other words, I don't really concern myself whether it went up or down. I just say, now I have an asset that I can have for generations in a trust. I've acquired something in my family that can last hundreds of years potentially 
if Verizon could survive that long. And there are companies that have survived. Ford's an old company. GM's an old company. Some have gone by the wayside. Some have not. So, so if you have real estate, I start with the rent. I say, how long would it take to pay off this mortgage? And they say, well, let's get a 30-year mortgage. And if you have enough rent, you can probably pay that off in 30 years. You'd always want to refinance. You'd always want to play the tax game. You'd want to do that. But here's the thing. It's not just rent. You say, okay, can I add vending? Can I add laundry? Can I charge for a rec room so people can have parties? Uh, do I have covered parking? Do I have storage unit on the property? And so all of a sudden you start thinking of all these other tangen you know, tangential type of revenues I can bring. Well, that's where options come in in my domain. Oh, okay. So this is my favorite part of, of what you teach. Like the, yeah. to me, the options changes the whole game. It's a, it is a game. It is a literal game changer. So then let's not do, a, a saying. It, it changes the game we play. So then let's do this. Let's really dig into this options thing right after this. Yeah. Commercial. Right oh. after the commercial. Hi, this is Andy Tanner from the Rich Dad Stockcast and founder of the Cashflow Academy. If you're enjoying what we're teaching here, then I think you'll also really enjoy a special on-demand web class I've created for you called How to Cashflow Stocks. I'm giving this free training to you because it's never been more important to enhance your financial education. Hey, who knows where the market will be next week or next year? For me and my team, we really don't care because we use strategies that will give us protection and cash flow no matter what is happening in the market. So if these are the kind of investing strategies you'd like to learn for yourself, go to StockCastBonus.com now and get this training at no cost. You can access this free training right now at StockCastBonus.com. So head on over to StockCastBonus.com now and I'll see you on the inside. All right, we're back and we are going to hear Andy's investing game changing strategy. Well, I don't know that it's mine, but it's one I like. Hey, before you get uh, into it, can I, can I tell you something? Yeah. Robert yeah. Kiyosaki, years ago when I started the company, probably a decade ago, he, he changed my entire life. And I'm not joking. He, you know, I always thought to retire, you had to have $5 million in the bank, right? Because you had to be able to pay for everything. Yeah. yeah. And I was like... I'm never going to be able to do that. I can't do that. Ro Trust me, Robert doesn't pay me enough. So, <laughs> so I was like, I thought I was just going to be the, a slave to the, to the grind for my whole life. But then he taught a really simple concept. He's like, well, how much money do you think, you know, when you're 65, you're going to need to live? Yeah. I don't know, 2000 months. I don't know. Pick a number. He's like, all you got to do is buy assets that produce that much money a month. That's can right. You do, can you do that right now? And I'm like, I can do that. That's I don't need this big nest egg. That is why Rich Dad Poor Dad sold, you know, what, 100 million copies, whatever it's at now, or 30 million in 90 languages or whatever it is. Yeah. It's 30, 40 million copies now sold, something like that. Yeah, 40 million. It's that picture of the financial statement. This is buy an asset that produces the cash. And that's when the light bulb goes off. Well, what's interesting is, is if you... If you add to your dividend uh, a simple option to buy it higher or sell an option in order to acquire it, I mean, maybe they have a 5% dividend and maybe you get a percent or two by selling a put to acquire it. Well, now you've got 7% of that thing paid for if you in the first year, if you think about it that way alone. Right, right. But if I continue to use basic call writing and basic options principles, um, that can be another source of, of income that can increase. And so notice I'm not talking about the stock price. And what's beautiful about that is let's say I buy it low and let's say the stock price does double over 10 years. The, the income I get from my dividend and calls are probably followed suit with inflation and uh, for sure with a higher strike price, uh, you know, you're going to get to, to ensure a stock at 50 is going to be twice as much as assuring a stock at 25, depending on its volatility. So, so learning the options game, uh, and, and what's interesting is you can play the options game both ways. If you're long an option, if you buy one, you're playing a capital gain game most of the time. 
Um, there's a third category, and we we uh, in my uh, company called the Cashflow Academy. We encourage people to develop what we call a financial blueprint. In other words, rather than just running around for the hot tip and saying, well, I just want to make money. What, what should I buy? Should I buy gold? Is it going up? Is real estate going up? Is the stock going up? Rather than being obsessed with the price of an asset, that you develop a blueprint that has that has a very deliberate understanding of what your goal is. And there could be three or more, but a minimum of three. Number one, you can invest for cash flow. That's my favorite. As a real estate investor, I've not been much of a flipper. I have bought and sold properties when I felt it was a good opportunity, but it's always been about the rent. I've never owned a, uh, an investment property that I did not rent out. I've never just flipped one. Well, that's not true. I take that back. Early, uh, we flipped one uh, way, way back. And I mean, we, we did flip one. But other than that one, all the others have, have been... Uh, for rent. Yeah. We're going to forgive you for the one flip. We're going to yeah, stock let that... investing. I think I made 25 cents an hour on that. <laughs> we were very young when we first married, when we did that. Um, you know, we've been married 30 years. So it's quite a while ago, but, uh, but, but the second thing is you can invest for a capital gain. You're going to try and buy low and sell high. And I do some of that in the stock market. I separate it from as a different part of the blueprint. It's more fun. It's fun. And when I see an opportunity to, Maybe short, like GameStop was a great opportunity. I said, I'm going to speculate and short that, try for a capital gain if it drops. Uh, and those are fun to do, but they are not the core. They're not the core of what we do. Uh, and then the third one is hedging, where I make an investment where I expect no return. I expect it to be an expense. I expect it to uh, be something that I buy that I'll never cash in. Good example of that is for me is physical gold. Um, I've never uh, bought an ounce of gold that I've sold. Never. Uh, if I buy gold, that money is, is if I tore it up and it's gone forever. And, and there's two things that can happen with my gold. A, it gets bequeathed to generations after me. That's the goal. Never get that money back. Never cash it in. It goes to the next generation. And ideally, they don't cash it in either. And it just stays in your family for eternity. Uh, the other scenario is if I sell it, that means that I needed that the dollar couldn't do its job anymore. It means that the dollars I have could not do anything, that they lost their power. And so it's an insurance against inflation. Yeah. When you say they lost their power, they lost their buying power. Yeah, they lost their inflation got yeah, No one trusts them anymore. And I think that's unlikely. I think that's very unlikely. Robert thinks it's extremely likely. I think it's possible. And, and I think it's possible enough, even probable enough, that I'm, I've got some gold. But I will tell you that the best investment uh, by far is something that has operational cash flow, something that gives monthly value or value all the time, something that would have a sales report or a revenue report, an asset that has no revenue report, like Bitcoin or gold or you know, if you had an oil well, as a revenue report, right. right? So if you aren't getting a quarterly report on sales uh, or rents, you know, some revenue report, it's not, it's not producing. And I will tell you that, you know, there's some huge advantages to real estate because of the, the leverage and the debt uh, and the tax, no question. Your challenge with real estate is, is it, does it fit your personality? Are you able to put together deals like Kenny? Can you raise capital? Can you, can you manage debt? Um, and can you play that big game? And then second is, is you, you've got to have some, you gotta be comfortable with being, if I get in a distribution with, I, I give my money to someone like Kenny, he's now got control of that. Whether, whether I want it back or not, it's his. He gets to decide whether they sell the property, what the distributions are. That control is now his. I'm very much like buying a stock, frankly, uh, other than I can sell my stocks when I want. And in Warren Buffett's letter, if you look it up now, I mean, they've, they've had their meeting. If you look up the most recent letter to the investors, Berkshire Hathaway, you'll see that Buffett talks about that. He said, there's often a detachment in prices of stocks that go too high above what they're fundamentally, you know, make what's common sense fundamentally, they often drop very low 
beyond what makes sense. That's why I love a good crash because it's a sale, basically. And he says that type of shooting fish in a barrel experience, quote from Buffett, says that doesn't happen outside of stocks usually because if you were to sell through the loom, it'd be a savvy person on the other there. They would look at the, it would be a fundamentals. They look at the fundamentals and it, there'd be no detachment. So he says, rarely can you get that as an insider um, by doing a deal. Like if I'm doing a deal with Fruit of Loom, I'm going to sell that. Rarely do I get that shooting the fish in the barrel experience. He just said that in his letter this last month. And so the ability to sell it, move it, upgrade it, you know, trade some cash flow for better cash flow is great. So you have all three of those in stocks. You can invest for cash flow by receiving a dividend and then supplementing that. Uh, for an earlier payoff uh, with, with option selling. You can speculate for cash flow by buy low, sell high, both with stocks and options. Or you can buy an option to protect yourself or what we call a, uh, a non-correlated or inversely correlated asset to hedge, where perhaps I buy an option without an intent to make money, but just in case. I'll give you an example of a long option uh, of both. Right now, I have a, a really popular position on consumer staples because of inflation. I wanted insurance against inflation. And I only wanted a little bit, uh, enough to pay for groceries for like a year. Like if it pay, if we had this much inflation, I get free groceries for a year. That's what I wanted. And that's what I got. Um, I, may, I bought some, I bought some uh, long uh, calls on long-term, they call them long-term, uh, they call them leaps, right? Long-term equity anticipation securities. So I bought these over a year long, they were 18 months um, option to say, look, I can buy low in case it goes high. And now those have become flush with value. Now I've sold some for income that actually paid for them. So I, I basically have no money in the deal now. Uh, I used a capital gain idea, or excuse me, a hedging idea. And I, I, I was absolutely, I told my wife, I go, we're going to kiss goodbye that money. Those long options. I said, what would it be worth it to me to insure myself against inflation? And it was less than what I pay for my car insurance and my home insurance. It was very much less. But because we've had inflation, um, those have exploded in value uh, to the point now where I could sell even further out of the money calls and pay for the whole thing, be risk-free. So the, the blueprint idea is the, the summation idea here is I would try to move myself as far away from, I just want to make money. Just give me a hot tip. I just want to make money. What's going up? Is it real estate? Is it gold asset class? Just saying, okay, what does my financial blueprint look like? What amount of, like you said, what amount of passive income would I need to be free of a job? And how many years would it take at, 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 at reasonable rates of return to get there? And if I'm not happy with that timeline, well, then more risk is taken, which means more education must be there to manage that risk. But to approach it from a standpoint of cash flow, what is the problem? Well, the problem is a, con a constant outflow of money. The problem of life is food, clothing, medicine, shelter a constant new bills in the mailbox all the time. So if the problem is a constant flowing of cash out, the antagonist of that would be a constant flowing of cash in. And if I have multiple streams of expenses, I have a AT&T wireless bill, I have a food bill, I have a rent bill, I have a car payment, whatever a person might have. If multiple expenses is the multiple streams of expense of leaking money out of a financial statement is the problem, then perhaps we consider multiple streams of income as being a, 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 an answer to that as opposed to a single stream of labor at a job. Right, right. And so having a blueprint of understanding when am I investing for cash flow and what is going to get me to my cash flow goal and how? When am I investing for capital gain, which is 401k, try it, buy low and hopefully it's high and I sell it someday to pay my bills. That creates an hourglass because, you know, if you, if you have money leaking out, your 401k, like an hourglass, begins to diminish. There's no streaming income in. It's just, it's what's there. It's a reservoir rather than a river. 
and the reservoir drains yep. over time. And then finally is what's your insurance play? Are you, do you have assets that you've purchased uh, that you don't expect to get money out of, but are there to protect you such, you don't expect to make money out of your car insurance. You do if you wreck. You don't expect to make money out of your home insurance, only if there's a fire. You certainly hope don't hope to, to make money on your health insurance. But if you wind up in the doctor's office with cancer, then it's important stuff to have. So I never expect or hope to get a return on investment on my health insurance. I never want to get a return on that. Because if I do, it means there's been a, a tragedy in my family. Right, right. So I don't know if that's interesting to people, but it is necessary to say, how much do I know about cash flow investments, capital gain investments, and protective hedging type of investments? So I'm going to throw something out there, but because we're, uh, we're over time here. We're out of time. Okay. But, um, so I, I'm studying with you and your team and, and taking your class. So free plug. Uh, definitely, definitely take the class. You're but, always kind. But uh, man, one of the things that like in this blueprint, this plan, it wasn't just, do you want to do capital gains? Do you want to do cash flow? It was to the point of how fast, like, yes. like how, what's the how day aggressive. The calendar? Yeah. Yes. And so I, you know, I'm all in on the cash flow. Um, and so I got to learn what do I need to do? Here's the date I want to retire. I need yeah, to understand yeah. how to make this much cash flow by that time, you know, and then, and then I pick my, I pick my level of risk. I, I pick That's right. the level of profit I need, however you want to word that. So, yeah, I mean, it was amazing. Like I said, the concept of cash flow versus capital gains changed my life. But, and then on top of that, you gave me the tools to do it. And it, I mean, it, it means a lot. So I, I, I know we got to, I know we got to end this, but okay, I'm going to say first, take Andy's course. But before you even do that, he has these webinars in our show notes. And at the very end of the webinar, yeah, at the end of the webinar, if you want to buy the course, you can, cool. But take take one of these webinars and you get to see Andy draw on the board. You get to not just hear us talk about it, but he'll illustrate it. And, and you'll really comprehend this concept of cash flow and dividends and how to combine the two. And the education alone, and I'm in the process of doing it. So I can't say that I can't say, Andy, you've made me financially free yet, but I truly believe you've given me the knowledge to do it. And, and I guess what I'm saying is I want everyone else to at least have that opportunity. So watch Andy's webinar. Um, I, I mean, that's really what I had to say. I appreciate the plug. And, and most importantly, let us know what you'd like us to address and, and put in the show notes, things you'd like us. There's things on your mind. Let us know. And I may not even have the answer. <laughs> that wouldn't be uh, a first, but if we do have some answers, we'll, we'll tell you what we've learned so far about it. Yeah. And if you could take one thing out of this, really understand that cash flow lets you retire generally far quicker than capital gains. Although I'm supposed to say not financial advice, blah, blah, blah. All right. All right we got to go, Andy. Thanks, but thank you again. And seriously, thank you. Thank you for the education you provided. See you next week. All right. Sounds good, man. Bye. Bye.